tout le monde. Et, donc aujourd'hui, le conférencier n'a pas vraiment besoin d'introduction. De, de, de il, il a été un pilier au département de physique à l'Université de Chapeau depuis presque 40 ans. Et, plus que 40 ans. Plus que 40 ans. <rire> et, il a fait de nombreuses contributions importantes, tant scientifiques comme administratives et de tout ça. Et donc, et, et son intérêt de recherche se concentre surtout dans les euh, supraconducteurs à haute température et, où il travaille depuis plus de 30 ans, peut-être 30 ans. Ouais. Ouais. Okay. Là aussi, il a fait des, des contributions très intéressantes. Aujourd'hui, euh, il va partager un peu sa compréhension de ce matériau avec nous. Donc, merci, André-Marie. OK, merci beaucoup. Donc, euh... oui, comme disait Yann, je suis assis. Uh, I am... Uh... Je vais parler en anglais. I'm really fascinated by high temperature superconductors. And uh, there's a new twist that I will uh, talk here about uh, ultra quantum matter, which is another way to look at, the, at this uh, problem. So if you have any question, you can, uh, you can interrupt. No, so the ultimate goal of this is to have a superconductor at room temperature. So you see, we are not really uh, too far. The, these are different families of superconductors. Uh, with their, the, uh, the year they were discovered and uh, the record they established at the time they were discovered. So in some cases, it's just because it's another family. And we see that uh, you're close to the room temperature here with these uh, materials, but at very, very high pressure. And uh, these are understood in some sense, these materials. On voit pas l'écran partagé. Whoops, big problem. Euh, nous, nous, moi, je vois tout comme il faut, mais je ne te vois pas de toi. Ah, mais ça, c'est correct. Il y a, en principe, c'est Yon qui, euh, qui transmet mon image. OK. Mais vous voyez le, la présentation. Euh, oui. OK. <rire> so... Uh, yeah, when we are in the other building, thing, these things will be automatic and you won't have that many problems. So <clears throat> these are, even despite the hard, the high transition temperature, they are believed to be in some sense uh, conventional. So I will focus on these uh, compounds that all have in common copper oxygen uh, uh, planes. And uh, so they look, uh, one of them looks like this. So you have copper in black and oxygen in red. And you can think of the rest of the material as uh, removing or adding electrons in the copper oxygen planes. And then you can consider this two dimensional model as sort of a caricature or the first order model for all high temperature superconductors that are, we call cuprites because they are copper uh, copper based. So the question is who ordered this because they have a very complicated phase diagram. So at zero uh, doping, so I will talk about doping, but here zero doping means one electron per unit cell, one valence electron per unit cell, okay? It's an antiferromagnet in the ground state. And as you raise the temperature, it becomes paramagnetic, but it's still insulating. So we call it a mutt insulator. I will explain what a mutt insulator this is in a little bit more detail. There's a phase that has a, where the density of state decreases, that's called pseudo gap. Then there's this phase which has linear resistance, uh, linear temperature dependence of resistance. It's called strange metal. It has some, perhaps uh, some quantum critical point or a phase transition here at uh, zero temperature. And the sup this uh, superconductivity that is at high temperature is in the presence of strong repulsion. So I will show you why this is a problem and uh, why it made these difficult, these problems difficult. And it has competing ground states. You see there's a charge density, charge order here, spin density wave and, and so on. So who ordered this is probably this guy, some kind of demon, but they have an, another hypothesis. That's the way that physicists who have looked at the problem for as long as we start to look like after a while. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we look at in the standard solid state uh, books is the, the band structure. And here you see there's a single band that crosses the Fermi level. So it looks like a very simple problem. 
And it's believed that it can be described then by this model as a two-dimensional Hubbard model. So you have a lattice, a two-dimensional lattice, and there's hopping between sites, it's called T, and T prime for the second neighbor and T double prime for third neighbor, et cetera. And uh, if there are two electrons on the same atom, then there's a strong repulsion, it's called U. So the Hamiltonian looks like this. So if you have no, no interaction, U is zero, you just have these hopping terms, and then you get this band that I showed uh, earlier. So plane waves are the solution for this problem. On the other hand, if I have only U, we see that the solution of the problem is to put, if you have, for example, a tough filling, means one electron per unit cell. So you put one electron in each of these cells and they don't move. So on one hand, you have a plane waves, and the other end, you have localized objects that look more like particles. So it's like the particle wave duality, if you want. So localized basis is not a good basis, and the extended basis is not a good basis. And it turns out that the, the kinetic energy that's described by this is comparable to the potential energy. So the wave function is as complicated as you want. It's highly entangled if you want to use fashionable, fashionable words. OK, now I talked about ultra quantum. So one band and also spin a half. Spin a half is as far as you can imagine from uh, classical spin, right? So suppose we are at half filling. So we have one electron per unit cell. And so it means that you have an electron here, an electron there. If U is dominating, you have no, no hopping. You st we start with no hopping. So that's a very simple solution. Now turn on the kinetic energy. Turn on T. What happened? Well, the electrons will want to uh, jump. And they can, if the spins are anti-parallel. If they're parallel, Pauli does not allow you to, to make the jump. But if they are anti-parallel, they, they can. So it means that the wave function now, instead of being just uh, this, will have admixture, admixtures of these terms. And they will be proportional to T over U, T being the, this, this hopping, because you know, we are expanding around U. So. so as far as energy is concerned, it, the energy goes down uh, with the quantity J here for these just these two guys. And J is called the super exchange interaction. It's 4T square over U. So that will play an important role in what follows. So I will ask you to remember a few things. You have to remember that there's this U for repulsion, that there's this T for upping, and then there's, there's J that's 4T square over U. Now for truth in advertising, uh, this is not the correct model in the sense that uh, there is the there, there are oxygens here in between, hmm? and they play. Uh, we saw them as the red here in this uh, this plot, and uh, they do play uh, some role. So what I'm going to describe today is sort of uh, work that's in a, in a way relatively old. It's in the last ten years or so, and what I will talk in part two is the role of oxygen, which turns out to be. Uh, a sort of a very nice, um, I don't know where to put it. <laughs> very nice uh, spectator that tells us a lot about what's going on. And I think you will be convinced in part two that we have uh, sort of uh, found something that will is revealing as far as the mechanism of superconductivity is concerned. So let's see why we call this system a mutt insulator. We, you can see this with X-ray absorption. But first, let's talk about just uh, theoretically. So a semiconductor here on the left, a semiconductor <coughs> has a valence, uh, a valence band and a conduction band. And if there are N atoms, okay, so each containing two energy levels, if you want, then there are two N uh, states. And in a semiconductor, they're just separated by, uh, by some gap. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. now in a, in a mud insulator, then the interactions are very, very strong. So you have to imagine that U is very large. And we put at that filling one atom, one electron, I'm sorry, per unit cell. So what happens? So it takes a certain energy to remove electrons there. 
Now, if you put another electron on this, it has to go on an occupied site. So it costs an energy U. So it means that you have <coughs> you have n states here that uh, with energy that corresponds to removing electrons and n state here to adding electrons. Now, what happens if you dope? If you dope a semiconductor, the Fermi level just moves. That's it. In a MUT system, is very different. Why? Because now you have one less, you dope, so you have one less electron here, you dope with holes. So there are n minus one states here. So you can add electrons on that will cost energy U on n minus one state, and you can remove on n minus one state. And you have created two states, so you're left with two n states again. You have created two states near the Fermi level where you can put the electron up or down. So how do we see this experimentally? <clears throat> we take, uh, li like uh, Patrick explained to me at some time, you take a very high energy uh, photon that extracts an electron from a core state and you look at the cross section and then you will get like, you see the energy here is 530 electron volts, so it's huge. And you start to be able to extract this core electron. So that's this first peak here. Now, suppose you dope, then this peak has to reduce in intensity. You see, if you go, to, if you dope, then the peak has gone down a little bit. And then this one here has gone, has, uh, has gained intensity because you have, you have states now that are available very near the Fermi level. So this is what happens as you dope. And you see that this one goes about twice as fast as the other one decreases. So it's quite convincing that this is a mutt insulator. What will be the take home messages? So the take home messages would be that most of the main features of the phase diagram follow from the Hubbard model. And that this physics is continuously connected to the mutt transition at that filling. So everything in the phase diagram is connected to the mutt transition. And we need to look beyond traditional tools of solid state physics to be able to understand uh, this. So I will tell you a little bit about the method and then about the one band Hubbard model, its prediction for the phase diagram, for the pseudo gap, for D wave superconductivity. And I'll talk to you about the phase transition at the heart of the phase diagram. And part two will be on the three band Hubbard model where oxygen can probe some of the details of the physics uh, so that's for um, some other time. So the, the, you, the way you work then is that you first use density functional theory to give you a basis. And then on this basis, you write down the Hubbard model and you solve it with dynamical mean field theory. So I will explain what dynamical mean field theory is. So it takes me, I, 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 I timed it, it takes me six minutes. So... <clears throat> If you lose track a little bit of what's going on, don't worry because it's, it's, it's not uh, crucial, but it's not standard solid state physics. So the problem that we have is to have at the same time the localized and the delocalized picture of the electron. So for the localized picture, suppose that you have an interaction U only on the four sides that are joined here on this uh, square. Then if you want to look at the effect of uh, interactions on the propagation of particles, uh, you have to solve this problem of electrons in a, in a bat. In other words, everything outside is not interacting. So it's called the Anderson model. And this, these electrons outside are, are non-interacting. So you can, all that they do is that they modify the way that the electrons propagate from site I here to site J. So it modifies the, <clears throat> the, the, the Green's function. So you, you can calculate the, 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 the effect of interaction that's called the self energy. <clears throat> so you have to sum this series of diagram to infinite order. Now look at the delocalized picture. Assume that you tile the infinite lattice with these uh, squares. So if you tile the infinite lattice with these squares, you can still hop from one square to the other. So there's some energy K tilde. The Brillouin zone is now smaller because you have a bigger thing. 
And so the energy here will depend on this wave vector, but the self energy here depends only on IG on every, every site. So the way to solve this problem is to solve the same skeleton expansion with the Green's function IG that is just projected back to the, to the cluster. So there's a, the, the power of this is that there's a self-consistency relation now between the lattice and the solution to the localized problem. The self-energy is the same in both cases. <clears throat> so what you need to determine self-consistently is, is this, is the way the electrons propagate in the bat. So it's called the hybridization into the bat. And this picture is called cellular dynamical mean field theory. There's also a, you know, a, a, some, an equivalent with periodic boundary condition that I will not describe in detail. Now you need something to solve this localized problem. It's called an impurity solver. So one way to do it is with uh, like David Seneschal does is with exact diagonalization. And another way is to uh, there are many ways to, to use continuous time quantum Monte Carlo. One of them, if the interactions are strong, is to expand, use a Monte Carlo procedure to compute to all orders in the hybridization function uh, the, uh, the observables. And now there are many softwares that are available to do that. We have our own. And there are many groups using these methods. I will go, I won't refer to everyone, but both in Europe, in the United States, in Japan. Now you need to critique this method. What is the problem with these methods or what is the advantages and the disadvantages? Advantages, what about long range order? Well, usually to do long range order, you do some mean field somewhere. But here we never do mean field on the cluster. The mean field is done in the bat that's supposed to represent the infinite system. So it's determined self-consistently. So symmetry breaking is allowed only on the bat. There's no mean field factorization on the cluster. And what's included exactly is the short range dynamical and spatial uh, correlations. What's missing is are the long wavelength particle hole and particle particle fluctuations. And it's good when the correlation lengths are small. So what to do, you, it's exact in the infinite size limit of the cluster. So you compare cluster of different sizes and you can compare real space and momentum space at clusters. Okay, back to our problem. You have any questions on the method? Okay, the phase diagram. I've already explained the antiferromagnetism when I explained to you the effect of J. Yes. So this method is mainly for two-dimensional strongly correlated. You can do it in to any dimension you want. Actually, it, three dimension two yes, three. yes, and it works best in infinite dimension where it's exact. <laughs> but these cluster sites are bigger in three dimensions. So it's yeah, you need, well, the, the, it's always a problem of computer power in the sense that even this these small clusters, they are in. in you remember, they are in an infinite bat. Mm -hmm. So it's still difficult to, uh, to solve. And this bat is dynamical. I mean, it depends on frequency. That's what's important. This G0 is a function that depends on frequencies. You have a mean field that depends on frequencies. So I already explained the antiferromagnetism. Everybody's happy with that. Now it turns out that the, the full phase diagram, no, I just flipped the diagram. And now you can think of this axis now as electron filling instead of doping. And the, the vertical axis is still temperature. So the full diagram is this one. I had, sorry, Patrick, I had the reference and it disappeared. It's, <laughs> it's in the review paper with Patrick for me. So yeah, there are two sides to this diagram. So this is the, so-called old dope side and the electron dope side. So that's the full phase diagram. And I will, the, 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 the electron dope side uses different methods. That, so that would be a completely other talk. And we work a lot on the electron dope uh, cases, which is also uh, very interesting. 
So this is a phase diagram that was found by uh, the group of uh, David Seneschal, Alexandre and Ferry Foley and Simon Verret. Uh, you see that uh, this is the order parameter. Uh, so what characterizes superconductivity and electron filling here on the horizontal axis. So this is half filling, one electron per unit cell. So you see the anti-ferromagnetic phase in red that has this uh, the right asymmetric shape. And if you look at superconductivity, it follows the orange uh, line. And then when it contacts uh, anti-ferromagnetism, it goes down along this blue line. And similarly on the other side. So you see that it's not a bad start. <clears throat> now I said that there are competing orders. So there are also charge and density waves and so on. And they are found in these uh, large cluster calculations. But if we look at what we do locally, we still have this. So this is again order parameter as a function of uh, doping this time. Superconductivity itself as a function of doping. And now if you look at the um, quick, uh, competing order bond density wave and pair density wave, these are this, these, uh, the orange line is for pair density wave and the blue line is for bond density wave and they compete with superconductivity. So superconductivity goes down. So you see that we have these uh, systems as well. Oh my God. Okay, let me say a few words about the pseudo gap. So this was done with Alexis Rimbaud, one of my students, and Maxime is now a faculty in uh, Trois-Rivières, Patrick and uh, Marion Tenon was in high school at the time. <clears throat> so the pseudo gap, if you look at the spin susceptibility as a function of temperature, and you look in your textbook, you will see that it's supposed to be Pauli susceptibility, so it's independent of temperature. Here, there's clearly a loss of something, I mean, some spectral weight at the Fermi level. In, in standard textbook, it's just a density of states. Okay? So there's, if you interpret it like that, there's a loss of density of states, okay. And this loss of density states occurs around this red, red, whoops, this red line that is slightly above another line where phase transitions occur. So this is what happens with the DCA 12 sites and you can see that it has the same shape as the experiment. If you look in detail, the, fit, the, the doping does not quite correspond. I mean, this is electron filling and whole doping, but, uh, uh, but uh, this is again an effect of the three band model. I mean, the point is that you have the same behavior with a maximum here and then at large doping, it, uh, it goes like that. So six sites gives the same, with four sites gives the same. So what is the physical origin? Think of a singlet, because again, it's very quantum mechanical quantity. So if you take, for example, a simple four site cluster that I talked about earlier, then the, the most probable state, not the only one, but the most probable state is a linear combination of these pairs of singlets. So it's close to what the Anderson called the resonance valence, resonating valence bond model. So that's the origin of the pseudo gap. And uh, we can compare with some experiments that uh, Louis's group did where there is temperature and doping again for one compound, YBCO, and, and for another compound. And this T star is not for the spin susceptibility, it's for the resistivity, but the spin susceptibility just starts a little bit earlier. <laughs> and this is what we get. So as a function of u, you see that u equals nine is this black curve. And if you go to u equals 36 is this red curve. So it goes down when you increase u. And here you see that uh, it goes down also when the nail temperature goes down. So it means that again, it's related to J. So when you increase U, J decreases. So that's why this goes down. And then if J is involved, it means these singlets are coming up. So that's okay. So, uh, so does, does the uh, T star injection material uh, agree with that uh, scaling matrix? So if you look at YBCU, you compare it to LSU, 
the T star are not exactly the same. No, so, so that's yeah. So that's what the we saw. That's we saw. That's what we saw here. Right? So you can look at other ones. I have not looked systematically at all the other ones. <clears throat> I will skip this part. We don't have that much time. So D wave superconductivity. Okay, let's talk about ordinary superconductivity. So where does superconductivity come comes in in these uh, the, the first materials, just <coughs> simple mercury or lead or simple metals. So if an electron comes in and scatters off um, a phonon, okay, the phonon is very slow. So you can have an electron with momentum minus p that scatters off the same phonon. And basically, what you have created are pairs. So you have pairs of electrons that go into another pair of electrons that are both characterized by p and minus minus p. And the they are the you see that the effect is retarded. You, know? if the, you cannot put two electrons at the same place at the same time, but you can put them at different times. So the equation the, the, it's retarded. So in superconductivity, there are two ingredients. There are these Cooper pairs that I just mentioned, and there's also phase coherence. So let's see how phase coherence comes in. This is the pair wave function for the incoming electron. And this is the pair wave function for the outgoing electron. And that's the interaction U. Now do some mean field. Okay, we can do some mean field there. So this is only the potential energy part of the interaction. But you see, we can lower the energy if this U is attractive, like for phonons, you know, a positive charge and negative charge. So if U is attractive, you can lower the energy. And the condition is that the phase of these complex objects is the same independently of P and P prime. Okay, if the phase is random here, you will, it will average out to zero. But if the phase is the same, it will lower the energy. So that's the mechanism between uh, for, for superconductivity. And to get something that's non-zero here, what you need to do is to have a wave function that is a linear combination of wave functions with different number of, uh, of particles, huh? because this destroys two particles. Uh, so you need to have different numbers of particles, but you have to add them up with the same phase. And if you're familiar with Coherent states with photons is the same idea. <clears throat> okay, now in these superconductors, we don't have the phase is not completely independent of P and P prime. I, I call them D wave superconductors. So what does that mean? It means that <clears throat> the order parameter, if you look in one direction, it has a certain sign. And if you flip by 90 degree, it's the same value, but it changes sign. So why is this helpful with repulsive forces like we saw for antiferromagnetism? Suppose this is repulsive, so it's positive. How can we get the lowering of energy? We can get that if P minus P prime scatters, for example, from the X to the Y axis. And if when it's large, let's say it's large for this type of scattering. And if Psi changes sign in going from the X to the Y axis, you've gained the minus sign you needed. Okay, so that's a simple way of seeing why in the presence of very strong repulsive forces, you have D-wave. The other advantage of D-wave is that it vanishes when it's on the same side, right? So if you have strong repulsion, that's what you expect. So there's a, the, it's consistent with the BCS equation. I won't go into that, but basically you're replacing the phonon with this antiferromagnetic spin wave. And that was proposed uh, long time ago, actually, by our colleague, uh, Bob Bonnet with Emery and Bialmono. <clears throat> and if you look at these, uh, these methods, the, these uh, calculations with uh, these uh, dynamical mean field calculations, this is what is plotted here is one over the pair susceptibility. The pair susceptibility diverges at the transition. So if one over P goes to zero, you have a transition. And they use they looked at very different cluster sizes, and the, the blow up here shows that for large cluster sizes, it goes whoops, it goes to zero before t equals zero. So so there's a transition, but that's u equals four. In our case, if you do experiments, you see that the antiferromagnetic correlation length is small actually. 
<clears throat> but so you and you are in a regime where the interactions, the the it's J that's important. So now if I rewrite these spin operators in terms of fermions, <clears throat> you see that you can factor two C's and you can do some mean field there. C. And then if you define the D-wave order parameter that changes sign if you go from X to Y, then you find that at the mean field level, you do have some attraction in the D-wave channel. But if you start from the original Hubbard model with U and you try to factor the U there, you never get D-wave superconductivity, you just get antipromagnetism. So that has been the, the, the challenge of the field if you want. This cartoon at strong coupling sort of gives an indication that it might be possible. But we need to do more serious calculations and this is what we, we have done. So this is a plot of the superconducting transition temperature for the, for the group of Gould and Millis with eight sites. So there is a transition temperature and if you increase the number of sites in the, in the bat, you see again something that looks more like the experiments here. And what we find here for different values of U is, is this. So forget this part for now. <clears throat> so it starts at U equals seven. So the, the superconducting transition temperature is, is this uh, here. The color is just the value of the order parameter. So this is a temperature on this axis and doping on that axis. Few things are remarkable. One is that if you go here from seven to U equals 16, you see that it goes down if you increase U. So again, it suggests that J is very important because J is proportional to one over U. Okay, the other thing is that it is uh, skewed a little bit too much towards affilink compared with these larger cluster size calculations. But if we take into account Phase fluctuations, in other words, you look at the spin uh, at the what's called the, uh, the stiffness of the order parameter. You, you can and you include that effect, you see that it becomes more symmetrical. So this can be interpreted as a mean field the transition uh, uh, temperature. Yes, Gennady. Yeah, I have a question. These models are basically uh, mixed and then mean field faster than. Do they have uh, either like what kind of topics they have inside the cluster, like T or Oh, yeah, inside the cluster. Uh, in the, for this model that I showed here, that I'm showing here, there's only T upping. And uh, here, and the here they have a T prime. I think. And here they don't. And in that sense, so is it like T prime changes? Like no, it's only U that changes here. You. Only you. So they have the same set of T prime is equal to zero, T is equal to zero. They have the same set of T and T prime. So there are many experiments that suggest that C Cooper pairs above the superconducting transition temperature. So that suggests an explanation, actually. As I told you, in this region, very close to F filling, there are a lot of phase fluctuations. I said that the superconductor is phase coherent. But uh, if you go to the superconductive transition temperature, it's called the Costellis-Stavis mechanism. You can be in a regime where the pairs are formed, but they are not coherent because the phase fluctuates. Okay. Now this uh, phase diagram, everything here is about the normal state, except for this line here that is the superconductic transition temperature. You see that it goes to zero at that <coughs> because it's a mutt insulator. And at large uh, doping, uh, then it's zero because there's not enough uh, anti-ferromagnetic uh, correlations. Now this line is the pseudo gut line that I talked about uh, earlier that falls very quickly like we saw in the plot. And then there are these other lines here. The background color is just the value of the scattering rate. And these are other observable quantities. But I want to show, okay, then I'm just reminding you of these uh, other calculation. Now, <clears throat> what we computed is the condensation energy. So in the ground state, why is it superconducting? 
And what we see here in this region at large doping, the red shows potential energy, the difference between the potential energy in the superconducting and in the normal state. So the superconducting state has, has a lower potential energy in this case. So that's a simple explanation I gave at the beginning. Very close to acetylene, that's actually it's kinetic energy that you gain. So the blue is kinetic energy. And you see that there's a change at this place here that's you know, related to the pseudo gap and to many other phenomena in the normal state. And this was this can be observed using some rules in, uh, in optical conduct in optical experiments. They have seen this change from potential to kinetic energy. Okay, now let's vary the value of u. This is the plot I was just showing you. U equals seven. At u equals nine, you see that the the kinetic energy gain goes over a broader scale. And what's surprising here is that as you decrease the value of u, you see a phase transition sticking out here. So we can understand these things that seem to come from nowhere as in the reality coming from a phase transition that's at a temperature too low for us to compute. So I hope you ask questions for this, but I skip the glue. And I will end with a phase transition at the heart of the phase diagram and its relation to the mud transition. So this is the work of Giovanni Sordi at the Royal Holloway in London and Auli at Rutgers and my former student, Patrick Simon. So when we looked at the Hubbard model, there was a site that was with the delocalized electron. So this metallic side. And then there's a U. So when, when U dominates, we expect the insulator. So at half filling, there is indeed a change from metal to insulator. And it occurs through a phase transition. It's not a crossover at zero temperature, it's a phase transition. And then as you increase the temperature, you go to a critical point. And above the critical point, there's this so-called Widom line that's known in the field of statistical physics. So if you're here, something strange happened, look down. It may be because <laughs> there was a first order transition somewhere below with the critical point. So now let's let's dope. Okay. So this was at at filling. Let's see what happens when we dope and see if there's a relation to everything we found before. So what you see, this is chemical potential here on this axis and filling on this axis. So you see that I change as I change the chemical potential here, I stick to one. Why is that? It's because the chemical potential is in the gap. So it's in the gap, you change it, it doesn't change the filling. And then it crosses over to some metallic state. It's compressible, the n, the mu is different from zero. And then there's a first order transition. That's the first order transition I showed you uh, before. So if we get rid of the superconductivity and look, just look at the normal state in this region where we saw the first order transition, there's a widom line here. And there's a precursor to this widom line that is the maximum in the spin susceptibility. That's a T star that we saw before. So we, so we explain both the, the, the T star and the spin susceptibility in the pseudo gap. And also inside the superconducting state, why is there this change in from potential energy driven to kinetic energy driven? And it's all related to the existence of this uh, phase transition. It's not there in one dimension. So the, the phi and sinishal are verified this. So that's the widom line I talked about. This I call the sordi transition, and this is the T star here on this system. Now I want to show you. Well, first there's an objection to this. The objection is that here, the, the if we don't allow if we don't if we don't allow antiferromagnetism in the bat, we find that. But if we allow the bat to become antiferromagnetic, if it wants, if it's self consistent, it will become antiferromagnetic. So perhaps all this is an artifact of this antiferromagnetism. 
So to get rid of this argument or to answer this argument, we look at the anisotropic, well, in general, the anisotropic triangular lattice. And if T prime here, this upping is equal to T, we are in a triangular lattice. You need to stretch this a little bit, but it's a triangular lattice. And on the triangular lattice, anti for, I mean, we get spiral order at zero temperature, but it takes a while before you, you get there. And in fact, there are many phase diagrams that show that you don't get uh, spiral, you get chiral spin liquids or whatever. But the point is that at finite temperature, we anti-ferromagnetism will not be in the way. So what happens? This is the these are the results of uh, of Pierre Olivier Downey doing his thesis and uh, Charles Dadid also and Olivier who is now at uh, New York and Mac, uh, Maxime in, in Trois Rivières. So if you look here. You see the curve is similar. Now it's distorted because we don't have particle hole symmetry. So you see here you get a metal, and here you get a, a pseudo gap. If this actually in this whole region you get a pseudo gap in the sense that if you look at the density of states as a function of frequency, that's what is plotted here. Density of states as a function of frequency, you see there's not a real gap, but there's a loss in density of states. At that filling here in the orange point, you get a real gap. It's hard to see here, but it really goes at a real gap. And uh, then again, a pseudo gap in this uh, region and a metallic state there. <laughs> okay, this is a complicated plot, but the, oh, the only thing I want to say is that we, you, this is at a fixed temperature. So again, this is a fixed temperature. And what is plotted here is a phase diagram of U and chemical potential. <laughs> So there's a chemical potential here where you are at half filling. And this is the chemical potential where you're at half filling. And you can see the mud transition. So there's U and there's, uh, you, you can you stick to half filling and you see that you go to the insulating state that is there. The, the chemical potential, the unit of the chemical potential is there. It's T. Everything I should have said, it's all measured in your units of little t. And so 4t is? 8t is the width. The width. Yes, the and goal. in this case, it's 90. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> because it's triangular lattice. So, so you see the mud transition at that filling is this. You go from metal to insulator. The colors are just the compressibility. Mm -hmm. And then at, if you go to finite filling, there's this sort D transition. And you see that it's continuously collected to the mud transition. And it turns out that it has some universal properties. You change the value of U, and if you just shift the chemical potential, the, the curves all fit on one another until there's a transition. So it's, uh, I mean, it's suggestive of something. We don't know why. We can use a fashionable word there. So, yeah, let me summarize. Yes. Okay, good question. So <clears throat> the mud transition is metal insulator. The sordid transition is metal metal. Except one metal has a pseudo gap and the other one does not. Okay. Yes, both are gapless, yes. So you see here, if you're in this region here, you get a metal. And in this region, you have this pseudo gap. And there's a first order transition in between. So at fixed chemical potential, you have two densities that are possible. So the transition is first order, but it's metal, metal. Yeah. So, so basically what it means is that the the like T star above that, that transition, so the yeah. there's already precursor of the sort of transition. Yes. Above that uh, up to T star. Yes. And then you get this signature of the pseudo gap, even though it's not yet fully open, and then it then there's a transition. That's that's what that's what okay. The the question was uh, yeah, yeah. So is this plot here? Uh, yeah, so you start from high temperature. So you start from high temperature. You see the there's the, the maximum in the spin susceptibility is occurs along this uh, okay. this uh, purple line. And then if you keep decreasing, there's something that happens to the spin susceptibility. Again, it changes curvature, it turns out. It was going down, 
Yeah. And now it is going to zero, but with a different curvature. Okay. So this is what happens along the Widom line here. And so if, you, if you're far from the, this first order transition, the only thing you see is a crossover to the pseudo gap state that is living here. And if you start here, you see the, it, you would get up to the first order transition. And if you start just a little bit next to it, you, there's nothing. And if you go back to, oh, we have to go back forever. So if you go back to these experiments, you see that the, there's a T star line ends very abruptly. Okay, so it's uh, similar to what we, what we find here. So let me summarize. So <clears throat> intrinsic to the dope mutt insulator, there's a pseudo gap. There's a first order transition as a function of doping if there is no competing uh, order. And it's that if the first order transition has a critical point at sufficiently low temperature, it may look like a quantum critical point. The quantum critical point is a transition at zero temperature. Then there's D wave superconductivity within the presence of short range spin fluctuations. So we have a tendency to form singlets and that leads to the superconductivity. There are other effects that uh, we have looked at, so for example, the effect of uh, near neighbor repulsion. So even if the near neighbor repulsion V is much larger than J, you still get superconductivity. The V is screened by the Hubbard interaction. And there are other recent experiments that are consistent with the dope mutt pictures. And there's a whole talk that could be done on entanglement related properties <clears throat> and not the broken symmetry phase characterize the onset of the pseudo gap at finite temperature. And there's a staff of the mammoth that was very helpful. And thank you. So the question is, uh, if uh, J explains both the pseudo gap and the superconductivity, why do you have two different phenomena instead of just one? So I would answer that the, the pseudo gap is sort of a high temperature phenomenon where you see that J just causes some crossover with the tendency to form singlets. Mm -hmm. And then if the temperature is sufficiently low, then you long range order. But the pseudo gap is not only, uh, it ends before super, as a function of doping, the pseudo gap ends bef before the superconductivity ends. So this, the pseudo gap is a very strong coupling effect related to the formation of J, but superconductivity can exist both at strong coupling when J is important. And I showed you that on the other side of the transition is the, you get a potential energy gain, which is really the weak coupling mechanism for superconductivity. So you have the two, the superconductivity is in some sense more robust to, uh, to this. It can exist both at weak and at uh, strong coupling. So yes, the question is whether pseudo gap is a sort of a precursor of strong coupling superconductivity. So I would answer yes. Thank you for the nice presentations. Um, I have two questions. So you, you seem to relate the, uh, the superconductivity to J. And J depends on T over U. So as you decrease U, you would, would you expect TC to, uh, to increase? Yes, and yes, it does, what, it does, yes. But I, you showed some graph when, when U was not large enough, then there would be no TC. No, it, would uh, be, it decreases. It, so the, the maximum TC occurs right at the crossover, if you want, between weak coupling where U is uh, smaller than the weak correlation, I should say where U is smaller than the bandwidth and strong coupling where U is larger than the bandwidth. So the maximum superconductivity you, get, you can get is in this intermediate uh, regime. And when I talk about this, the, the, when I talk about the three band model uh, for part two, uh, you will see that as well, yes. 
you can see even in this plot, for example, you can see that it, this maximum here occurs at u equals seven. Mm -hmm. And then if you go, for example, to u equals 5.6 here, now there's no more, there's no more, uh, there's no mud gap. You're in, so at that filling, you're in a metallic state if you don't allow for antiferromagnetism. So you see, it doesn't go to zero anymore. It's actually maximum at that filling. Again, it's just if you <laughs> artificially forbid super antiferromagnetism. But if you focus just on the superconductivity, you see that from weak to strong coupling, it first increases and then it starts to decrease. Another question is that does, um, does this model agrees with the pressure dependence of TC? Yes, the, yeah, the question is whether the, it agrees with the pressure dependence of TC and the answer is yes, because if you apply pressure on, a, on, a, on the whole dope uh, coup rates, then the TC uh, increases. So it means that applying pressure means increasing the hopping between uh, unit cells, which means that T goes up. And if T goes up, J goes up, okay? So it's consistent. Now it turns out that in electron dope coup rates, it's the opposite. But that can also be understood by the same argument because the, as I will show some other time, not in part two, but perhaps part three or part <laughs> 17, I don't know, it's like, you know, if it works out, you do a sequel, so. <laughs> For now, there's only part two that's uh, in the uh, predicted. So if you see, if you're at weak coupling here, if you increase uh, uh, the, the, the hopping T, it's like uh, decreasing U, so you go, you go this way. So, because this way, if you decrease U, the superconductivity goes down. Yes. Okay. But it's a very simple-minded uh, picture. It's not based on... Uh, Actual calculations of the hopping and, and everything. You assume that U doesn't change with pressure. Yeah, yeah. I assume that U doesn't change with pressure. And one, maybe one last thing that uh, and get the in the in your Sati uh, phase, Sati transitions. What's the other parameter? In the uh, what? I'm sorry, I missed the question. You uh, in the, in the uh, you said you had a Sati uh, phase transition. Sati uh, transition, yes. What's the other parameter that uh, that says represent that phase? Yes, very good question. So, so, so let's start with this. So, what is the order parameter here at that filling for the mud transition? Well, an example is the the uh, is the uh, double occupancy, for example. So there's a jump in double occupancy as you go from there to there. So double occupancy, you're not, so double occupancy, I mean the value, expectation value of n up times n down. So you don't expect that the, you know, the, the expectation value of n up and down has anything to do with an order parameter, but here it, it does actually. So it's like a liquid gas transition in some sense. It has a, it has a scalar order parameter. And this is this critical point is in the easing universality class. So in the case of the Sordi transition, it's the density that jumps from here to there. So you, take, you can take the density as the order parameter. In the same way as you, in a liquid gas transition, you take the density as the order parameter. So it's again in the Zing universality class, it does the same, it has a first order transition, a critical point, and the exponents are those. But it's not going from zero to some finite value, it's, it just change. Yeah, the same way as in liquid gas transition. You, it's the difference in density that is zero at the critical point, and that increases as you go down along the first order line. You see what I mean? So you can take the difference in density as the order parameter if you want it to be really zero at the critical point. And do you have a, a, a symmetry breaking something? Usually phase transitions read to some symmetry that it's break, broken? Or? Well, it's the same as in the, 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 the liquid gas transition. So in the liquid gas transition, what is the broken symmetry? If you map that to an easing model, you can see an order parameter in terms of the magnetization. So mm -hmm. here it's the same idea. If, the, if you map this to an easing model, you can 
make the, the, the magnetization becomes the order parameter or here the difference in density is the order parameter and but uh, strictly speaking there's no broken symmetry i mean a liquid and a gas have the same symmetry well, i'm saying that and if you have a transition between two gapless states, yeah, if I have a transition between two gapless states, yes, it's hard to expect that there is a order parameter sort of eigen or whatever class is because it's a gapless state, it's quantum critical, critical, so it's basically zero. Conventional order must be zero on both sides. On both sides, uh, I suppose, yeah, if you talk about a quantum critical point, you mean that you know this point goes all the way to zero temperature, right. So in our case, um, it, it goes to very, very low temperature, but it's not zero temperature. So at zero temperature, at least as, as far as we can extrapolate in this first order transition year or this one year, it, it still remains exactly first order at zero temperature. So we don't get uh, into this paradox that uh, at the quantum critical point, you have the, you don't have an order parameter. It's really, you have to think of liquid gas transition at finite temperature. That's what's happening here. And there's a critical point in the liquid gas transition. So it's the same thing for the MUT transition. And for the SORDI transition, I did not plot it the same way, but that's exactly the same thing. Yes, uh, thank you, André Marie. It was a very, very nice talk. Uh, I, um... On this slide precisely, I, I have a question. So uh, I, the Widon line, as far as I know, is some kind of a thermodynamic uh, uh, a line, which is uh, which is seen experimentally as a peak in the heat capacity, for example. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. And I was wondering if you how you go from this to the linear dependence of resistivity uh, uh, that is observed in in cuprates. Okay, so if you ask any theorist to compute the transport quantity, he will run away. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, but uh, nevertheless, we, we are doing it within some approximations that are less controlled than for thermodynamic quantities. And it turns out that uh, um, if you are uh, that, uh, well, it's another paper uh, and, and uh, if you so there's the there's the uh, this uh, pseudo gap here, but if you start from the zero temperature and you see you go, you don't touch the this pseudo gap line. You're just here at optimal. Let's say if superconductivity people call it optimal doping. Let's let's go to back to 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 this picture. <clears throat> so. <laughs> You have superconductivity. Okay, the dome will become more symmetrical when you take into account phase fluctuations, and then the pseudo gap ends uh, here at this point. And this is where, at zero temperature, there's this change from potential to kinetic energy driven. And if you include the effect of uh, phase fluctuation, that's about. The, I mean, uh, okay, I need to do some plots here. We just have some preliminary results there, but the the, the optimal uh, TC occurs basically where this pseudo gap uh, line ends. So if you start from optimal to TC, you don't have a pseudo gap in the way. So that would be the strange metal. And when we do calculations of resistivity in uh, this region here at and going down, here we see a pseudo gap. In other words, there is a, a direction in momentum space where the scattering rate becomes very large. And there's another direction where the scattering rate is linear in temperature. And when you're on this side, then all the, scat the, all the directions have uh, linear in temperature scattering rate. But uh, so in some sense, it's related to the existence of this transition in the sense that it's to the right of this transition, <laughs> but not more than that. Okay, so th there is nothing really fundamental with the fact that the resistance is linear with temperature. Okay, it's a certain like, cut in the it's a certain cut in the phase diagram. Well, what is fundamental about the linear resistance, as far as I'm concerned, 
is that you have these uh, spin fluctuations that are in some sense responsible in the end of the whole phase diagram. Okay. So if the spin fluctuations become soft uh, at this uh, in this region, so their characteristic energy is uh, is small, <clears throat> then you go in a in a regime where the uh, it's it's like the high temperature regime of phonons. If you remember phonons, if you're above the uh, the by temperature, the resistivity is linear. And it's because why? Because the Bose factor tells you that the number of phonons is proportional to KBT. The, that that's it, and you don't have any more any characteristic energy anymore because the the, the by temperature is small. So here, similarly, the spin fluctuations are doing the whole phase diagram, and if they become soft near the phase transition, then it means that. If you compute the resistivity, it will be linear again for the same reason as the phonon. It's because you're above the characteristic spin fluctuation frequency. And then the number of spin waves, spin waves are bosons. So the number of spin waves is proportional to KBT. And uh, that gives you the scattering rate that's linear in temperature. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I'm a novice in, in this topic. So maybe pardon my kind of naive question, but I'm. I would like to understand kind of the physical, um, high order physical uh, picture of the Widom line. And in particular, I have kind of an interest in, uh, well, an interest in the following sense. So um, obviously um, superconducting state is formed by correlations and you've made that point loud and clear. So I'm curious if you look at um, statistical um, uh, fluctuations of the spin, uh, degree of freedom, particular, not, not in the superconducting state, but near this widom line, uh, would, would there be any precursors of the superconducting state that would appear in the, in the maybe higher order statistical moments? The way I interpret this plot is, in some sense, the, these lines that you plot is, is kind of first, first or first order analysis of the uh, probably ultimately related to the uh, uh, spin uh, spin fluctuations but is there any information beyond this first order second and higher uh, um, particularly near this widom line so this is a very interesting uh, question let, let me first mention that uh, okay if you go back uh, to where to this okay so the first part of your question, you were talking about the maximum in specific heat, right? And the widom line. And indeed, uh, the, there's uh, some divergence at the critical point. So you expect that there's still some maximum left as you, as you go away. And indeed, within this, these methods, if we compute the specific heat, we do see a maximum across the widom line. Uh, but I should, do, I should go back to this. Okay, along this widom line, we see a maximum in specific heat. And that's also observed experimentally by the group of Louis. There's a, some maximum in specific heat. Now, the second part of your question is whether there's information into higher order moment of the spin fluctuations. So, okay, that will be part 15 of my talk. So if we look here, basically this is what this paper addresses, but by computing the entanglement entropy across the widom line. And what you find is that the entanglement uh, related properties <coughs> have uh, do see the existence of this widom line. And, uh, and, and, and entanglement entropy contains information about all correlations, not only the first or second, uh, all correlations. The problem with uh, uh, this calculation is that it's still very primitive because it, it considers the entanglement between the entanglement entropy between one site and the rest of the lattice. You would want to do as a function of system size if you want, but uh, at least if you look at the way that one site is entangled with the rest of the lattice, we do see signatures of this uh, in the entanglement uh, uh, related uh, properties. In that case, it's not a maximum. I think it's more like an inflection point, but there is some uh, uh, 
that's the best answer I can give at this point. And if you're interested in looking at higher moments, uh, and there's good reasons, uh, yeah, perhaps one could do that. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. Maybe just a quick follow up. So would you know if there are any experimentalists Experimental groups that are looking to verify or to 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 explore the statistics beyond the first moment, so to say. Uh, the statistic beyond the first moment in the spin fluctuation. Well, yeah, exactly. If Bertrand Relais is still there, he can perhaps okay, okay. answer. Yeah. Can you answer, Bertrand? Yeah, yeah. I would. I would. Well, I, I, what I know are experiments uh, on higher moments, but on on uh, on. Uh, uh, electrical properties, so current or voltage. Uh, I know there are some uh, some ex there have been some experiments on on magnetization fluctuations, but um, uh, I guess here it's, it it would be more complicated. There is no net magnetization or whatsoever. But can can I mean if if there is a let's say higher order spin correlations, would that translate into some Statistical properties of current fluctuations. I would imagine. Another thing I can see is that uh, one thing that has been measured is the uh, Fisher information, uh, which for spin fluctuation, because the uh, Fisher information is I'm not, I'm not sure I'm saying this correctly. Uh, sorry, getting tired, I suppose, but. This, <laughs> this picture information is related to actually spin-spin fluctuations that are measured in uh, neutron scattering experiments. So that part has been done, but again, a little bit like entanglement uh, properties, it, uh, uh, it looks at, um, it looks at, uh, I guess in that case, it's only another way to look at spin-spin fluctuations uh, and not at higher moments of the spin fluctuation. Yes. Okay. So in this paper, we also looked at mutual information. Uh, well, thank you so much. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be sure to read your paper. Thank you very much. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Okay.